So with what we've learned about diversity and disparity, what is our responsibility? With this information, what is our responsibility as priests? First of all, it is to know God. The more we learn about diversity and disparity, the more we uh, begin, begin to really understand what it means for there to be multiple persons of the Godhead. Uh, and, and now keep in mind, too, that this is not what is expected in modern Judaism and Islam. Even though they believe in the one God that we spoke of in the last chapter, they do not believe in the multiple persons of that one God. They don't believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They believe there's a single God and only one person. And they think that it is wrong to think otherwise, but it's only a God of multiple persons, which really makes sense of the fact that he created such an incredible diversity of species, far more species than would be expected, uh, than is necessary for life on this planet. Also, the fact that we have this incredible diversity of life suggests that God loves variety because of his very nature, because of the diverse nature of God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. He cherishes or enjoys diversity, which I think can be an encouragement to many of us because that means even within a species, not only does he love the many different kinds of species that exist and have created a wide variety of them, but he also enjoys the diversity that's found within a species. So you and I differ from each other and from other human beings. We're unique, and God likes it that way. He wants that. Uh, diversity, uniqueness, differences are cherished by God. Many times in, among humans, uh, uniqueness is not cherished, especially among children. But uh, in God's eyes, he enjoys or he cherishes uh, diversity. The more we study diversity and disparity and recognize that these things have been put here so that we would understand this about God, uh, the more I'm impressed with the very nature of God and desire to worship him and bring others into worship. And again, as we do that, as we study his creation, learn more about him, are awed by what we learn, turn into worship of him and bring others into worship, we are functioning as creation priests. What is our responsibility as kings? Well, first of all, it is to preserve the biodiversity that exists on the planet as much as possible. This is actually a field of biology uh, called conservation biology. This attempt to make sure, to the best of our ability, we do not exterminate species. We do not allow species to go extinct. We should, for example, not over-harvest food species, those critters and plants that we eat, we shouldn't uh, kill so many animals and harvest so many plants that in fact populations of these organisms go extinct. We did that with a passenger pigeon. Uh, believe it or not, people ate passenger pigeons. They're little guys, relatively little guys, so uh, it took a lot of them, I guess, to make a meal. And so many of them were killed that the population of passenger pigeons in the 19th century got to where uh, there weren't enough of them to continue surviving, and we lost them all. The passenger pigeon went extinct. It nearly happened with the white abalone, again, a it's a sea, uh, a clam-type organism that people eat, uh, very desirable to many people, uh, very good tasting. We harvested so many of them, we ate so many of them that it nearly brought them to extinction. Some people stepped in and said, no, wait a minute, if you keep doing this, we're going to lose it all together. You're not going to have that food that you think is so great. And we're able to save the white abalone. We need to study organisms to find out what population size they need to have in order to keep on going. And then once we learn what that is, we need to make sure we do not kill more organisms than uh, we need to and make sure we don't get to that point where the population is too small to support that species. Also, we need to be careful as we build new houses, uh, lay out new streets and subdivisions and cities, that we do not do that to the destruction of species. 
uh, we, we're, we're tearing down forests and prairies and this sort of thing to build these sorts of things. But realize that as we do that, we're destroying the living space of a number of organisms. We need to be sensitive to that. You need to find maybe alternative ways sometimes to uh, destroy less land or to allow organisms to live among us. Uh, we've, we've done that in a variety of ways through time. We've threatened organisms in various ways. Logging in Africa has threatened the gorillas. They've nearly gone extinct. There aren't very many left because people are logging away the forest the gorillas live in. The ivory-billed woodpecker in the U.S. was threatened by logging as well. In fact, it's very possible that the ivory-billed woodpecker is actually extinct. I've heard reports that it's been, rep it's been cited that individuals exist from here time to time. But if they do exist, there are very few numbers of them, and they're likely to go extinct if they're not already. It's a sad thing. It's a very beautiful bird, uh, and, but it was exterminated or nearly exterminated by logging. There's a Texas salamander that is threatened right now by uh, humans consuming so much water as to lower the water table and dry areas that were once wet, the living uh, environments of that salamander. As we built, uh, built dams on rivers, especially out in the northwestern part of the United States, the salmon that once spawned, were birthed way upstream and then made their way down the streams and into the ocean, lived a few years down there and then came back up those streams, uh, we got to where we actually uh, created dams that prevented those particular uh, fish from going back upstream to where they originally spawned. And uh, they tried, they'd come up to a dam, for example, and couldn't get any further. The water is too deep and running too fast for them to spawn and produce offspring. And many populations of salmon were in fact exterminated in this process. Now ingeniously, what some people have done to avoid this problem is actually create a cascade uh, waterfall along the side of the dam that's just wide enough for the, for the salmon to jump up that uh, cascade and into the area above the dam. There are ways perhaps that we can uh, build our dams so that we don't prevent species from getting upstream. Uh, sea turtles have been threatened with extinction because we love our beaches. We put uh, houses on the beaches and we have people out there using the beaches. We put our hotels on the beaches. And the beaches are the places where the sea turtles lay their eggs. Uh, and increasingly the sea turtles are finding a harder and harder time to find places to lay their eggs. And what we've begun doing is setting aside portions of the beach uh, for the sea turtles uh, we've got plenty of beach. We don't have to use all of the beach. We need to find ways to cohabit with the organisms of the planet to make sure that we don't destroy the species that now exist. We should work to save a species from extinction. Those that are threatened with the possibility of going extinct, we should work to make sure that they do, do not, at least if we can. We've come to classify species into categories here. Uh, we've those species that where the number of organisms alive is actually declining uh, at such a rate as to suggest that it's about ready to go extinct. We call those species endangered, where the numbers of individuals are too low to allow that species to continue. Those are the species we are most concerned about that are closest to extinction. Those are the species that need the most work, the most of our effort to prevent their extinction. Then there's another group called the threatened species. Those would be ones that are close to that, um, that number, that minimum population size they need to survive. And if they lost any more, they would be in the category of endangered species. We don't know how many species in the planet are actually endangered, how many are actually threatened. Uh, but censuses that are taken, 
where we're counting in particular areas how many endangered, how many threatened, how many other species are there. It turns out that typically something on the order of about a third of all the species in a given region are in either one of these two categories, endangered or threatened, which is kind of disturbing. It's a very large number of species that are therefore uh, in, in a position where we should be concerned about their survival. One way to uh, help address this situation is to be strategic in how we save or what species we save. We might have to make decisions, since there are so many of them that need, need to be protected. We might have to choose certain species to, to be saved and others to let go. And so we've, uh, one of the ways to do that is to actually examine areas around the world, identify, identify areas around the world where there's a very large number of species, especially endangered or threatened species. And these areas that have the highest number of them, we call those biodiversity hotspots. They're places where the high, uh, biodiversity is the highest. And if we can save those areas, if we can pour, pool our resources and, and save those particular regions, we can, in fact, save a larger percentage of threatened and endangered species than by going after helping individual species around the world. Uh, so identifying biodiversity hotspots and then working to save them might be an efficient way to address the issue of preserving biodiversity. Uh, one of those places, for example, is in the southeastern United States, uh, in Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, in the southern Appalachians. Very high diversity, highest diversity outside of the tropics for a number of different organisms like uh, the uh, flowering plants and turtles and salamanders. So preserving those areas, making sure that humans don't destroy the species in those areas might actually save a large percentage, a large number of organisms from extinction. And again, we've said this before and say this again, if you have to make a choice between two organisms, which one to save uh, from extinction and which one not, if you have one organism which is the only remaining uh, survivor of an entire created kind, a Brahmin, then preserve that one in opposition to an organism that is one species among many that are known from Brahman. Uh, in the case of losing an organism from the last species from a Brahman, we may never be able to recover that. But it's possible that when you have multiple species from a given created kind, that the information for building the species that you've lost or about to lose may actually reside in other members of the created kind. That's not going to be the case if, in fact, you lose an entire Brahmin. So we need to preserve Brahmins before species. If we have to make decisions, we choose the Brahminic species before the others. Also, it would be a good idea that we avoid what's called reproductive cloning. I've mentioned this briefly before. Cloning, which is creating exact copies of things that already exist, doesn't increase diversity at all. In fact, if increasing the number of organisms means somebody has to, uh, has to disappear, then cloning actually decreases biodiversity. Cloning includes cut and taking cuttings of plants. Uh, when you take a cutting off of a plant and then raise that plant, that plant has exactly the same DNA as the plant from which the cutting was made. When you do that, you haven't increased the biodiversity. You haven't even preserved the biodiversity. You have, in fact, effectively decreased the biodiversity. Uh, embryonic splitting is another way to create uh, clones. This is a situation where you take a fertilized egg and you watch it uh, as it develops. It will divide into two cells, two cells into four cells, and if you're very careful about how you do it. After it divides into two cells, you separate those two cells without endangering the two cells. Each cell now has the ability to grow into a separate organism, even though they have the same DNA, because they have only one fertilization event. 
They are clones of one another, identical twins, if you wish. When we do that kind of thing, and that's commonly done in uh, practices such as in vitro fertilization, you are again not increasing the diversity or even maintaining the diversity, you're effectively decreasing the diversity that we find. It's even worse with adult clones, meaning you take the cell from an adult human or an adult animal, you persuade it or convince it that it's actually a fetal cell that needs to develop into the whole organism, and when you, or if you're successful at that, the animal that results will have exactly the same DNA as the animal from which it's taken, or the plant from which it's taken. And the effect of that, again, is not an increase, but a decrease in diversity. So I would maintain that it is unwise to engage in uh, reproductive cloning of any sort, whether it's plants or animals, because it decreases the evidence of diversity that's in our world about us. Finally, not only should we be preserving the biodiversity that was, is there, but we should be enhancing the biodiversity that we see. And one of the ways is to uh, continue in our breeding process. In, when we breed uh, cattle or sheep or deer or pheasants, we end up uh, discovering new types, new varieties, cultivars, breeds that increases the diversity of organisms across the planet. And this is, this is one viable way in which we can actually increase biodiversity on the planet and thus bring even more uh, honor and glory to the God who created it.